the last few weeks as we've been studying the book of James, we've been looking at how faith is not just for Sunday, it's not just for church, but how really it affects every aspect of our life every day of the week. And how the authenticity of our faith is tested in real life situations like trials and temptations and relationships. And last week we talked about how if our faith doesn't affect what we say and how we say it, then really it's useless. And I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of opportunities to reflect on that and to apply that in my own life during this past week. I hope you have as well. Today in James chapter 4, we're going to be looking at how we make decisions now, it's hard to think of anything more practical than that because decisions are part of our everyday experience. We all have important decisions that we make day in and day out, like Coke or Pepsi, Ford or Chevy, iPhone or Android, regular or decaf, Big Mac or Quarter Pounder, Letterman or Leno, PC or Mac, vampires or werewolves, Ginger or Marianne. Chuck Norris or Steven Seagal. But seriously, I know that many of you are really wrestling with important decisions in your life, decisions that have consequences, and you really want to make sure you get those things right. Like, should I leave my job and take that job offer? Should I go to college? Where should I go to college? What career should I pursue? Should I, uh, where should I send my kids to school? How should I discipline my kids? Should I have that surgery? Should I get married? Should I get married again? And who should I marry? How should I invest for retirement? Where should I retire? When should I retire? Where should I spend my volunteer hours in the community or in in the church? Should I move to a larger house, to a smaller house? What neighborhood should I live in? And we're all looking for answers about how to make those kind of decisions in the important issues of life. And we don't want to mess those issues up. We feel like they have real consequences, like they really matter. And I can relate to that feeling because the majority of things on the list that I just mentioned are, are decisions that I've faced myself in my own life in just the last three years. So I know how important that feels. And so we're going to look in the book of James in chapter 4 today to get some practical help about decisions. But it's more than just helping you make great decisions. What we really want to do is to find out how our faith in Jesus Christ applies to the decisions that we make in life. In other words, what does God want? Does God even care where I go to college or when I retire? And if he does, how do I know what he wants me to do? So please open your Bibles to James chapter 4. We're going to learn some more today about faith for the tough choices of life. Okay, so while you're turning in your Bibles to James 4 or in your, on your apps, on your phones or whatever, I, just, I can't pass this up. Ross's intro was so fun. I just have to ask you while you're turning to, your, to James, how many of you are ginger guys? Raise your hand, ginger. Okay. How many of you are Marianne people? Okay, that's good. How many of you have no idea what we're even talking about? Yeah, my 10-year-old son knows what we're talking about because he loves Gilligan's Island. His uncle and aunt gave him the whole, all three seasons of, of Gilligan's Island, so he knows, knows exactly what we're talking about. But I just need to say right off the bat, I'm a Tracy guy. My wife's name is Tracy. Ginger, Marianne, mean nothing to me. Tracy, I love you. There's a little shout out to her. And I also have to say, um, he's, he made the comment about um, making the decision. You're, we're trying to decide about God's will for our life. Should I, should I uh, get married or should I get married again? I want to make sure everybody understands he's not talking about you couples who are sitting there who are already married. Please do not think about whether you should get married again. That's not what he was talking about. He was talking about if you are no longer married or if you aren't married or haven't been married. So I just had to clear that up before we get into James chapter 4. All right, so chapter 4 in James. It talks about how faith affects the way we think about and plan for our future. Now, here's the thing. We know that becoming a Christian is not about how hard we work, right? I mean, our salvation is earned entirely by Jesus Christ. Hopefully if you've learned that already, you already know that truth. We, we talk about that in 101. Jesus died for us on the cross, and when we trust in Jesus, everything is ours in Christ. Forgiveness of sins and new life and the Holy Spirit, which is God himself, actually takes up residence in us 
All of that stuff happens at the moment of salvation. So here's the question, really, that, that we're getting at today. The question is, well, but what about for the rest of our life? It's one thing for God to do everything for us on the cross. Jesus died for us. We can't earn our salvation. But as far as our future goes, don't we have to earn that? I mean, as far as our careers go, don't we have to earn that? As far as the the neighborhood we live in and the cars we drive and, and that some of these decisions that we're making and whether we take this job or this job, I mean, a lot of this stuff, part of the question we're going to see as we look at this with, uh, with the book of James, a lot of this stuff is, is going to some of those questions. Like, it's one thing to be saved by a gift, by grace, but we don't live our lives like that, do we? Don't we earn it? I mean, after all, I tell my kids, I don't know what you do, parents, but I tell my kids all the time, you have to earn it. You have to you have to earn your grades, and, and we, we incentivize our kids to get good grades, right? Because we're thinking about their future, and we incentivize, incentivize our, our kids to do well because we know that some of them are going to have a boss who isn't going to love them with a fatherly or motherly love, right? They're going to have to earn their way. So this is part of what James is getting at when he talks about this. He, he's basically saying, okay, Jesus paves the way for our salvation, yes, but who paves the way for our future? Who paves the way for our kids' future? Don't we have to earn that? And don't we get what we earn? I mean, this is, this is part of the dissonance, part of the tension between living our lives out every day, the other six days, as, J- as we're looking at in the book of James, and, and then our faith. Like, does our faith really affect that stuff? Let's look at the text. James chapter 4, verse 13, it says this. Now listen. You who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And look at what James says. Instead, here's what you should say. If it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now, I know there's a lot of words there. There's a lot of verses there, and it might be a little bit confusing at first. So let's break it down. I think that James is talking about the attitude that we should have as followers of Jesus when we think about and when we plan for our future. So as you get that thing in your mind, the thing that, that maybe you're thinking about after Ross's intro, your, your career or, or your family or a relational thing or whatever, whatever those big decisions you have, get those in your mind and let's look at some of the things that James is talking about when he's talking about the attitude we should have. Let's break it down. I think the first thing he's saying is this. Don't be greedy. When you think about your future, don't be greedy. See, the context for this entire chapter, it's good for us to see context when we're trying to understand God's word. The context for this whole chapter is a little bit earlier in the chapter. In verse 2, it says this, you desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. In verse 3, it says, you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. See, this is what he's meaning This is what James is referring to when he says in verse 13, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, we'll spend a year there, and we'll carry on business, and we're going to make some money. That doesn't sound evil, that doesn't sound bad, but when you take it in the context, you realize he's talking to people that have gotten this, this attitude about their lives. And what they've done is, is it seems clear that they've separated their relationship with Jesus from their future plans, from their career plans, from their job choices, from their, from their ventures, from everything, that, from the way they invest. Have you ever done that? Have you ever separated God? Have you separated your faith from your career? So on Sunday you come and you worship and you show your kids that and maybe at, prayer t- at meal time you pray together. But the rest of your life is completely different. It's like you put, you put the faith stuff, you put the Jesus stuff, you put that up on a shelf. It doesn't really have anything to do with the rest of your life. You put that on a shelf when you go to work. You put that on a shelf when you go try to make a business deal. I mean that's part, that's part of what he's talking about. 
He's saying you get this attitude that you say, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there, and by golly, I'm going to carry on some business, I'm going to make some money. And his whole point is you're doing it without regard to your faith. We'll talk about that more later, but I want to I go through some of the other things that I think that James is saying about our attitude. Here's the other thing I think he's saying about our attitude. It's this. Don't be arrogant. Look again at verse 16. It says, as it is you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. Here's, here's the idea. I think here's what he's getting at. We know that we're saved by grace, but everything else we get because we're good. My career has nothing to do with Jesus. The reason I have my great career is because I worked hard and I went to school. It's because I have a master's or two master's or a PhD or whatever. Have you ever heard people that talk like that? Have you ever been a person that talks like that? Where when you, maybe you're a Christian, but that's just about your salvation. When you think about anything else you've done in your life or when you think about anything else for your future, you think, I can get this because I'm so great. And, and, and what James is saying is you're boasting in arrogance and it's evil. And go back to the context. Again, earlier in the chapter, in verse 6, James wrote this, and this is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So I think what James is saying here, when you're thinking about planning for your future, he's saying don't arrogantly try to pave your own way. Don't think that your future endeavors have nothing to do with God and his blessing on your life, because they do. And remember, every gift, every gift is from God. Every good thing is from God, not just your salvation. Everything is. So your future is, your spouse, whatever spouse you have, the kids and your kids and how well they do, it's not just because you're a great parent. You're gonna need a lot of God's favor and blessing. I mean, can we get an amen from the parents right? We all, you could be the greatest parent in the world, and at the end of the day, you have to acknowledge that without God, without his, his influence, not only on your parenting, but on your kids, then all of it's for naught. We need God for our future just as much as we need God for our past. So don't be arrogant. I think he's saying another thing. The third thing he's saying is this. Recognize then that everything is from God, that God is the source. He says in verse 14, why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Job before, but this reminds me of the story of Job. He goes through all this turmoil in his life, and at the end of the story of Job, he, he He's yelling at God, and he's, he's angry, and he's upset with God, and, and finally God answers him, and he says, what is your, who are you? Did you create everything? Who do you think you are? Do you think you're the source of anything good in your life? I don't mean to offend anyone. I'm just saying, this is what James is saying. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. That's why, again, back to the context in verse 10, earlier in the chapter, he said this, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. We have to recognize that everything's from God, that God is the source. So when we're planning for our future, when we're thinking about our future, our attitude needs to be, God, you're the source. Every good and perfect gift is from you. And so we seek him for our future just like we seek him for our salvation or just like we sought him for our salvation for those of us who are saved. And then there's just the fourth thing he's saying about, his ad, about our attitudes. The fourth thing is this. We should submit ourselves to God's will. Right? This is what he means in verse 15 when he says this. Instead, you ought to say this. If it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. He says this is the way you should think. This is the attitude you should have. Your attitude when you come to the table, when you think about the future, shouldn't be, we're going to storm that city and make a lot of money. Your, your attitude should be this. If God goes before us, if God will build the house, then we will succeed. If it's the Lord's will, then everything's going to work out. That's the attitude that we should have. So we should be, we should live lives as, as followers of Jesus. James is saying this. We should live lives, listen to this word, we should live lives in humble submission to God, in humble submission to his will. Like, like Jesus in, in the garden when he prayed to the Father, he said, he said, God, let this cup pass from me, but he said, not my will, but yours be done. He submitted himself to the will of the Father, and he, Jesus was God himself. How much more we who are created beings 
How much more should we submit ourselves to the will of God? How much more should we say, I'm going to humbly submit myself. Whatever you give me in the future, wife, kids, career, job, you name it, whatever it is, I'm going to humbly submit myself to you. If it's the Lord's will, we will do this or we will do that. That's the attitude we should have. Now, all of this stuff here is about our attitude. But here's the practical question. I want to end with this today. The practical question is, how are we supposed to know God's will? I mean, this is all just attitude stuff. Don't be greedy. Okay, I'll try not to be greedy. Don't be arrogant. Okay, I'll try not to be arrogant. Recognize that everything's from God. Submit yourself to the will of God. Well, what's his will? How do I know his will? I've got Ginger and Marianne, or whatever it is. I've got this person and this person. How do I know who God wants me to marry? For you young people who aren't married. Again, for those of you who are married, that's not the question you should be asking. You already have your wife. How should I, how should I know what school to go to? How do I know where to send my kids to school? How do I know how to parent them? How do I know whether to take that promotion or to take this job or to move to this city? How do I know whether I should be in ministry? Some people who have been considering going into ministry. How do I know these things? How do I understand? How do I know the will of God? So many people say, man, I wish God would just speak audibly to me. I mean, have, I won't ask for a show of hands, but if I did, I bet you almost everyone would raise their hand and say, yep, I've said that before. Or at least I've thought that. I've wanted to know God's will. And if he would just tell me, then I would know what to do. If he would just make it clear to me, if he would just make it so obvious to me, then I would be able to easily do God's will. Well, let's talk about that practically. How do you know God's will in your life? What do you do when it comes to knowing God's will and discerning God's will? Here's here's two things I want to say. First of all, follow God's will in the big stuff. See, there's no question when it comes to the big, obvious stuff. God's will is all over the Bible. He makes it so clear all over the Bible. Let's take an example of this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says this. And I, I'm gonna, I want to tell you, give you a little spoiler alert. At the end of this passage, here's, I'm going to read it to you. At the end of the passage, it says this. For this is God's will for you. Okay, so the end of the passage is going to say this. Now let's go to the beginning of the passage and read it. It says this, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, and here it is, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And this is just one example. God has so clearly revealed his will for every single person who's listening today. He has so clearly revealed his will for the big picture stuff in his word. I'll read it again. Encourage, help, be patient, don't pay back wrong, strive to do what's good for everyone else, rejoice all the time. Always be praying. Give thanks and all. These are things that, I mean, you, we can add to that. The, there's all kinds of lists about the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, thankfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is all part of God's will for you in your life. It's all part of his big picture will for you. Walking in the fruit of the Spirit. So here's the question. Are you following God's will in the big stuff? Because if you're not following God's will in the big stuff, I would suggest that you have no business asking what God's will is in the little stuff. Because here's the thing, when you tackle the big stuff, the little stuff tends to work itself out. This is what Jesus was getting at in Matthew 6. He says this, so don't worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? He says, for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And he says this, but here's what you should do. After saying, don't sweat the small stuff, he says, this is what you should do. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then what will happen? All these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus said this himself. And this is what James, I think this is what James would be saying as well to us. 
Here's the big idea. Now, don't, don't get offended by this. I'm just, I'm just going to say something here that could be a little challenging for some of you today. But I don't want you to point at your neighbors and think about your neighbors. I want you to think about yourself. Don't pretend to care about what God wants for you in the small stuff if you're not following him in the big stuff. If you're not honoring God in your life, if you're not helping other people, if you're not doing what 1 Thessalonians 5 says, if if you're not doing what, what Galatians says about the fruit of the Spirit, if you're not doing what Romans 12 says, there's so many places in God's Word that make it so clear. I mean, there are so many places in James. Just think about last week's. If you're not following God's will in taming your tongue, then and you really don't care about that stuff that God has so clearly revealed in his word, why do you think, why do we think that he's going to tell you what he wants you to do in the small stuff when you're not even being obedient in the big stuff? I mean, this is, I think, what, what we have to come to grips with. When we start with the revealed will of God first, then we can watch Matthew 6 come alive in our lives. When we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which is what this whole book is about, James is all about this. It's all about, it's all about faith for the other six days. It's all about not compartmentalizing our faith. It's all about not taking this, this thing we call Christianity, this thing we call salvation, this thing we call our faith in Jesus Christ, and putting it up on a shelf except for once, one hour a week when we come to church, or maybe one day a week. He says, don't do that. He says this, seek, he doesn't say, Jesus didn't say seek first his kingdom on Sundays, and then all the rest of the days do whatever you want to do. He says, no, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and what does he say? All of these things will be given to you as well. What things? The worries of tomorrow, the worries of the future, the questions we have about the future. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't some stuff we could talk about as far as specific questions you have about marriage and schooling and finances and jobs. There are all kinds of stuff. In fact, in the video playlist for this week, make sure you check out some of the extras. Here are some of the, some of the names of the extras. Here's one of them. How to know if you married the right person. I'm serious. That's one of the videos we have in our playlist this week. Check that one out. Or another extra called Where Jesus Wants Your Kids to Go to School. Again, there really is an extra called that in the playlist this week. Make sure you check out this week's video playlist. Or Who Cares If I Graduate from High School? That'll be a fun one. Or uh, my favorite, my personal favorite, the extra this week is called Yep, That Job is God's Will for Your Life. Now, we'll get into some of the details about those things in those videos. But for right now, because we're running out of time, you just simply need to know this. James 4, 17, he says it like this. This is how James wraps up this whole, this whole passage. James 4, 17 says this. If anyone then, and he's talking about discerning God's will for the future. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. <laughs> in this, uh, this, I think, he has Matthew 6 in mind or something like it. I, I think he's, he's saying this, listen, live your life as a Christian every day. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the stuff you do know. Do you know who God wants? No, you don't. Maybe you don't know who God wants you to marry if you're not married yet. Maybe you don't know whether God wants you to have that job or not. But here's what I believe, and I put God to the test on this. I believe if you begin to honor God in your life every day, I believe if you begin to submit to God, I believe that if you begin to, to tackle the big stuff, the revealed will of God, the 1 Thessalonians 5 stuff and the, and the, the fruit of the Spirit stuff, I believe if you begin to really seek God, then... I bet you, you'll have the answer to those other questions and the small stuff. Because I think that's what Jesus was getting to. That's why the psalmist said it like this in Psalm 37. He said, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Put your hope in the Lord. Travel steadily along his path. He will honor you by giving you the land. Go back and study that. Memorize that passage this week because here's what it's, it's lifting up this tension that we're talking about 
in this message today. This tension between this. Well, I know that I'm saved by his grace, but isn't the future up to me? Don't I have to participate in the future? The the point is this. Here's what you do. You don't so much worry about the future. You honor God in the present. You live your life for God. You, you You commit everything you do to the Lord. You trust in him and he'll help you. It says, it says that the Lord directs the steps of the godly. So what does that mean for us? If you, wanna, if you want your steps to be directed in the future, if, my, if I want my kids to have their steps directed in the future, the only thing I need to tell my kids is to be godly. I just need to, to tell them to pursue God. I need to tell them to, to trust Jesus and to honor God in their lives and to help other people. And when I do that, here's what I know, because I'm not going to be there for my kids so many years down the road. There are going to be times in their lives when they're going to make some decisions and and dad and mom aren't going to be there for them. And I need to know this, that they have trusted God and they're honoring him with their lives. And then I know that their paths will be directed because God's word says that they will be. Put your hope in the Lord. Travel along his path and he'll honor you. That's what God's word says. And when when you begin, when we begin to walk like that, Man, we're going to have this tremendous sense of joy and freedom and expectation when we think about our future. So let's bow and pray together. God, help us to to do just that. Lord, I pray for the people who are here listening today who are struggling with some of these very things. God, some of these small things, maybe it's even hard for them to hear that these are small things because they don't feel small to them. And they're not small to them and they're not small to you. But God, your word is so clear to us that if we honor you in the big stuff, in the stuff you've already revealed, in your general revelation in your word, God, if, if, if we honor you in those things, God, that you will direct our paths. And, and so I pray, Lord Jesus, that every person who's here would begin to do that. God, that they would truly be seeking you with all of their hearts. And God, that you would begin to give them the answers for their future. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.